always grateful to God to be in the house of the Lord. We certainly do honor our bishop, and we certainly do honor each of you. Grace and peace be unto you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And certainly our prayer to God is that we have all come to learn about the Lord. The scripture teaches that we must study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman who needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. They asked me on tonight to switch gears for a moment and talk to you about some practicalities with regard to why money matters. Let's just have a word of prayer. Father, we love you. We bless you in the name and through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We certainly give you all the glory and all the honor and all the praise. Magnify you, Lord. You know that without you, we can't do anything. But with you, we can do all things. We know that all things work together for good because we love you and we are called according to your purpose. And for that, we give you glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Just a little background. <clears throat> Money matters. That's our topic the subtext of it, from my perspective, is biblical stewardship. And you want, we're going to be talking about biblical stewardship in many other facets that are practical for us in this world in which we live in today. So one of the things that we want to talk about, remember that in Ecclesiastes, in the 10th chapter, the 19th verse, at the C part of that verse, they, the, the, says, it's, the scripture says, and money answers all things. Money gives everything. And there is a reason that money is critical to us as believers is because God uses money as a tool to help us to grow and to build and to become productive as a part of a, of a general society. And so from a practical perspective, we want to be able to do what God has called us to do. And money is a part of that process. So let's talk about what do, we, what do I mean then about what uh, biblical stewardship. Biblical stewardship, listen, by definition, a steward is one who manages or administers something that belongs to someone else. So when you talk about the beginning, the question for us is what do we own and what does God own? Remember that in the beginning, the Bible says that God created the heavens and the earth. And since God created everything, he owns everything unless he gives it to someone else. So uh, Psalms 50 talks about every beast of the forest is mine. The cattle of a thousand hills, you've heard this before, belongs to the Lord. I know the birds of the hills. I know the moves of the field. The, that it makes it clear that God has retained ownership of everything. So technically, we own nothing. God owns everything, and yet he makes us stewards of everything that he has in the earth so that he, through us, can be glorified. So the remaining question for us, from a practical perspective as believers, is what kind of steward are you? Are you a good steward, or are you a bad steward? A good steward administers that which is placed in his or her ownership the same way that the owner would. In our case, we're saying that everything that I have belongs to God. Then the question is, how would God manage that situation that you are in? How would Jesus, how would the Holy Spirit manage your scenario? Think about that from a practical perspective. What is required of me. I can do the easy thing, I can do the common thing, and I can do the practical thing. And most of us have to think about, when we talk about stewardship, we think about it in the terms of money. We think about our houses, we think about our cars, we think about what's practical, clothing, shoes, taking care of ourselves, self-care, that's, that's the thing that we're doing also, that's all stewardship. How do we manage this life that God has given us and how do we do life, quote unquote, in the best possible way so that we, through him, might glorify the one who gave us life. We don't own us. Our bodies, the scripture says, when Paul talks to the Corinthian church, you remember that you belong to the Lord. That's why he talked about sanctification, consecration, holiness, justification, all of those things that are recognizing that we are owned by God who is our creator. 
and he has created us in his own likeness and image. So stewardship is spoken about how do we handle this? The question for me was and is, how do I handle that which God has entrusted to me? God entrusts your children to you. He entrusts your business to you. He entrusts your work to you. He entrusts your employment, your education, your mentality, your intellect, your skill set, your gifts, everything that God has entrusted to you. How are you managing that? And from a practical perspective, you remember Jesus teaches in parables. And one of the parables that Jesus teaches is in the Matthew 25. And in Matthew 25, he gives, as an owner, he gives talents. It's, this is a parable of talents. You've heard this before. The meaning of Matthew 25, it's verse 14 through 30, is a parable of talents that teaches about responsibility, teaches about the consequences, teaches about using your gift, teaches about neglecting the use of your gift, and it teaches about what God has given to each of us and how we, through the use of our gifts, should multiply it. One person he gave a talent, he multiplied it by five. One person he gave a, a talent, he doubled it. But then there was that one who didn't do anything. So there's consequences on what side. The question always is, how am I managing what God has given me? What has God entrusted? Now you have to think about this. Because why does money matter? Why, do, why does my relationship with the Lord in the practical sense of life, why does that matter? Because God is entrusting me with this gift, okay? So think about that and talk about good stewardship. And listen, good stewardship does not just talk about material things. It's about everything. Good stewardship is your call to ministry, what are you doing about that? Good stewardship, as, as Paul tells Timothy in uh, 1 Timothy 1 and 11, the gospel of the glory of blessed God with which I have been entrusted. And Paul always reminds Timothy the gifts that the Lord has stir up that gift in you. And he will see you to the end. So the deal is that we've been trusted not just to material goods, but to talents that we've been blessed with. And we extend those talents into ministries that we have been called to. And every Christian is called to something. You say, oh, I'm not called to anything. Yes, you are. You just have to, this is my favorite thing, lean into the Holy Spirit. And as you lean into the Holy Spirit, the scripture teaches that he will reveal to you what he wants you to do. The one of the things in, when you talk about Jesus talking at his dissertation, Bishop talked about this on Sunday about the guardian. When you look at that practical conversation that Jesus is having in John 14, as you continue to move along in John 14, 15, 16, and 17, which is where the priestly prayer is, in John 16, he says, how be it when he, the spirit of truth has come. 1613, he will lead you, guide you into all things, and he will what? Show you things to come. So you say, I don't know how to, then I ask the question, how much are you leaning into the Lord? How much time are you spending in the word? How much are you talking to God and asking the Lord, Father, I have this, I'm wired this way. We used to talk about being hardwired. Certain people are hardwired to be musicians, hardwired. In my case, I was hardwired to be in the law business. I've been doing this since I was 16 years old. Hardwired. And what you do is, if that's in you, then thank God we have parents and friends who will say, you know what, you really are good at that. And as you develop that stewardship and move forward in that stewardship, then biblical stewardship requires us, listen, I'm going to call on God to give me strength and to give me ability so that this thing that's in me that he's entrusting me with, that it can magnify, that it can grow, that it can develop so that I can give God glory. Remember, the bottom line for me, always you got to glorify God. I don't care what you're doing. If you're not glorifying God, you need to check yourself because it has to glorify the Lord. We are believers, and our testimony is exactly that. Every 
I'll say it like this. There are people who admire you that you know not of. There are people that are watching you that you will never see. And in a practical sense, so the testimony that you present in your moments, that's why I, I anyway, let me get out of that. I'm not even going to go there. <laughs> I'm careful, because you have to know that whatever you're doing, people are watching you. Okay, so that's still what? Good what? Stewardship. Say that word with me, stewardship. God, good biblical stewardship requires that. And here's what Paul tells the church at Philippi. He says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And that's not a carte blanche. It is a carte blanche in many ways if you are leaning into the Lord. But if you're just out here living inappropriately, <laughs> then don't run around here talking about I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Because I'm looking at you saying, well, well, where's the Jesus in that? That's impractical. It's improbable. And that's not good stewardship. Your relationship with Christ is entrusted to you as well. It's not just that Jesus died on the cross. You die daily to self. You die daily to self. And the scripture teaches that you have to live unto the Lord. So if you are dead to yourself, you say, how do I die daily to myself? Then you check yourself. And I, and I, and I say that with all respect. You know, I can just, I can be who I am. Right. And how's that fitting with this whole relationship with Christ? How's that working for you? I'm just asking. You know, how's that working for you? Because you can't get anything done. And the beauty of stewardship, and let me get back to this, but the beauty of stewardship, particularly as it relates to Christ, is that those things, you say, well, I'm struggling, I'm struggling, I'm struggling, and I, it makes me wonder, why are you struggling? When are you going to yield and give it to the Lord so that that struggle can begin to tamp down? Because the more you give it to Jesus, the less the struggle is going to be. Because the Lord is going to help you in a practical way understand that situation, that scenario, and whatever it is that your propensity is, your proclivity toward that thing, so that the Lord can deliver you from that so that you through him might have a testimony that says, you know what, the Lord delivered me from that. Like, nah, I man, I'm good. You're going to do it? No, nah, I'm, I'm good. Why? Because I'm delivered. Okay, that's a part of what? Stewardship. It's still a part of stewardship. I work hard, I love hard, and I'm walking in the grace of God hard. Okay, so I recognize that all I have, everything I do, even my very self, it's all to glorify God. And obedience is a part of that. In Him, we administer what we are trusted with according to His will as he wills. So you say, like Jesus at Calvary, in the Garden of Gethsemane, in the humanity of Christ, he says, Lord, take this cup from me. And in the divinity of Christ, he says, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. So at that moment, the entrusting of the whole world and the weight of the world is upon the shoulders of Christ. And so you yet still see that he has entrusted him. So good biblical stewardship acknowledges in all that we do, we belong to Jesus. He gave it to us, and we live for him. Because here's the deal. Stewardship is our response to God's love. It's our, this is how I show Jesus that I'm, I'm good, I'm saved, I'm living for the Lord, I'm a living epistle. I'm going to manage what he's given me, my gifts, my calling, everything that I might glorify God. So my biblical stewardship is a demonstration of my love for Christ so that I can give him glory in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 And so one of the things that we talk about money, I know we talk about money, but I'm going to always talk about Jesus. Y'all just get ready for it because he's coming. Okay, <laughs> so this is the deal. What does the Bible say to us? We're talking about stewardship, because we're still talking about money, why money matters. What, are there instructions that we need to follow? Most of it are going to be in Proverbs, but are there instructions that we need to follow with regard to managing finances? Are there instructions that we need to follow that regarding uh, avoiding debt? Are there instructions that we need to follow with regard to accumulation of wealth? 
All of those things are there. The Bible speaks to that and helps us to give the advice that we need is in the scriptures and the warnings that we need are also in the scriptures. Okay, Proverbs 6, for example, it's a very good proverb in 6 and 1 through 5. It says, listen, debt is like being hunted down by the hunter. It's in there. My son, if you put up security for your neighbor and have given your pledge for a stranger, back in the day they used to always tell you, don't be a, a, be a surety, it's S-U-R-E-T-Y, surety for someone else because you don't know if they'll pay that debt. And what would happen is, this is what we call a guarantee. You know, I'm the guarantor. That means that if he don't pay the debt, guess who gonna pay it? You gonna pay it, okay? And in the old church, they used to tell you, don't, don't, be, don't do that. You can't sign for somebody else, because you don't know, because it's a character test, all right? Stewardship is also a character test. Why does money matter? I'm testing your character. I'm chasing after that dollar. Let that dollar gonna whoop your behind because you won't be able to catch it. You're going to always need one more dollar. Don't chase money. Ooh, let me get out of that. Don't, I'm, just, but I'm telling you the truth in Jesus' name, amen? I told you I'm going to bring Jesus in everything. Don't chase money in Jesus' name, amen? All right. So here we go. So get, and, and here's, a, here's another thing that he does. And you talk about, there's a proverb that talks about the ants, if y'all ever read the proverbs, how the ants work day and night to get prepared. So one of the things is Proverbs 6 warns us about laziness. You know, it warns us about borrowing. It warns us about going into debt. And it also tells you, listen, give attention to that. And the reason I say give attention because money matters. Give attention to your money. This is interesting because you, if you don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm challenged by this even in my own life. I'm in the process of, of doing some refinance. And so now I need to make sure that I know what my credit score is. Okay, I need to be able to understand that. So you need to know practical, why does money matter? You need to know what your credit score is. You need to know what's your debt ratio. You just spend and spend and spend and why? And then you can't give a tithe, stop. You don't let that, you know, Habakkuk talks about it, and Haggai talk about it too. There's a hole in your pocket. Right? Because you don't have the right priority. You have to make the Lord the priority. So you have to be, understand this also, Proverbs 23. Remember that sometimes wealth can be like a fleeting sheep, a fleeting gazelle. A gazelle runs fast. It can be fleeting if you have the wrong attention. Okay, why does, why does money matter? What you want to do is contrast that so that we can do the work that's needed. And you work because you need the bread for your home. You take care of your children, your husband, your wife. You're faithful. And you will abound in blessings because you will not hasten after richness, even though I like rich. I'm good. <laughs> Money's better. I agree with that. Money answers all things. Yes, that's true. Because you want to be able to take care. I got to keep my lights on. I got to take care of my insurance. I got to do this. I got you got that in this society wherein we live. Practical, practical things. You have to have the finances in order to meet those obligations. And and really, and I say there's never enough because every month and bills come. And you still, <laughs> okay. Let me balance this out. They come every month. And you have to have the balance and the, and the uh, discipline to do it right. All right. But here's, here's my, my point in this in terms of Jesus. Our finances belong to God. And what he intends for us to do, the reason that the Lord pays you that $100,000, pays you that $200,000, pays you that half a million dollars, gets you that royalty, that, that $10 million check, is because he wants you to do and have a good purpose. What is the purpose? Provision for others. Take care of your family members. Make sure that you're generous and you're supporting the work of the ministry. Make sure that you're giving to those in need. And even, yes, you can take a vacation and enjoy yourself. Give a few gifts and all that. All this is wide stewardship because we're faithful to whatever God has given us. And what I'm saying to you is being rich is not wrong. Say amen to that. <laughs> being rich is not wrong, but what we want to do, and listen, being poor is not wrong either. What we're doing is, what we want to do is not squander money, 
okay? We want to not to be in, so in love with money that we're hoarding it for the wrong purpose. All right, we want to be able to manage our fa finances as best we can because the whole point of this is this. Set your mind on Jesus. Set your heart on the things of God. What does God value? Why did the Lord anoint you and give you that talent and give you that gift? And how can you use that thing to glorify the Lord? How can we do that? So what we do is we ask the Lord for wisdom so that we can be what? The best stewards of what he provides. This is the point. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows bountifully will reap bountifully. Each one of us has to decide in our own heart, not reluctantly or under any kind of compulsion. Nobody's compelling you to give. We encourage you to give. We encourage you to be a tithe, a tither. We encourage you to give offerings. But nobody can say you got to pay dues to be in church. We're not doing that. You're here because you love the Lord. And we encourage you to give because you love God. So in a practical sense, this is what we're doing. We're talking about why does money matter. And here's another thing, practical points now. This is what this, this class is about, practicalities. Should I have insurance? Mm-hmm. Answer is yes. Why? Well, you live here in, in the United States of America. Do, you, do I need life insurance? Please get some life insurance. Yes, you do. Do I need car insurance? Stop running around here without no car insurance. You need some car insurance? Those of us who are in my profession, do I need professional liability insurance? Yes, I do. You sure do. And in these United States of America, do I need any kind of insurance that I can get? Yes, I got to have health insurance because their medical expenses would be horrible. I'm, I'm doing, do, I need everything that I need because in many, many ways, stewardship, again, it's just practical as a Christian in America to make sure that we have insurance. Should I have, if I buy a home, should I have homeowner's insurance? Yes. Auto, my, auto liability, not just that little cheap, you know, SR22 stuff. I'm talking about if somebody get hurt, I don't have to pay nothing out of my pocket. I have a, a good enough policy that covers anybody's physical, personal, uh, as well as their car, personal injury insurance, medical insurance. I talked about that. Malpractice insurance, yes. All kinds of insurance, mortgage, everything else. Why? You say, well, it's not really necessary. I'm living for Jesus. Yeah, but listen, read Romans. Read Romans. It's in there. We're in this, and we have to obey the law of the land. It's impractical. You can't go down a highway at 99 miles an hour, and the speed limit says 15. Stop it. Okay, we are practical people. This is what... Now, see, this is why this is class. These are the common sense things that we need to do and know that there is a biblical reference to it so that we can be good Bible stewards. Money does matter. All right, good stewardship. Let me, let me skip to another one. I'm going to show you another one. What about retirement? Should I have a retirement account? Of course you should. Why? I'm a Christian. Jesus is going to take me. Yes, but what is the perspective, beloved? You ask the Lord, Lord, how are we going to do life, and how long am I going to do life in this body? And if I'm going to do life in this body to 90, 100 years old, do I have to have a retirement plan? Of course you do. I've been working in a, in a railroad. No, you need a railroad insurance. I'm talking about some practical stuff. Well, I'll get Medicare, and I'll get Social Security, but them little dollars ain't going to last you for the next 100 years. Should I have insurance? Yes, you. When it comes to taking care of ourselves, God encourages us to do what? Be wise. Okay? Work hard. Be wise. He wants us to make wise decisions. He wants to set us up for success and not failure. He wants us to work hard. Yes, he wants us to be able to take care of our needs. And so that you are not dependent on somebody else. You say, you know, don't be foolish. Prepare. Plan. Plan. Lay things out. Think it through. You say, oh, I don't want to uh, take care of my end-of-life documents. I don't want to do all of that. No, but, uh, baby, them things are expensive. Plan. Why does money matter? Because there's some practical sides to all of this. This is the practicality of what we do. In addition to loving Jesus and running up and down the aisles, we can leap and shout and jump. But then at the end of the day, the Lord says, in business, be what? 
men. So we have to take the practical approaches, the things that God talks about, good stewardship of money, good stewardship of the toil that we do with our hands. And here's the thing about Joseph. Anybody heard about the Joseph School of Business? You know that Bishop is talking about it all the time in all of these ILS and that things that are coming up is because he's teaching you the practical answers to things. You're going to build a business, you have to have some practicalities. You have to know what foundation, what documents do I have to have? What accounts do I need to open up? What kind of money? What kind of percentage? What kind of ownership uh, scenario? Should I do an LLC? Should I do an S Corp? Should I do a C-Corp, what should I do? Is it a partnership? Is it a sole proprietorship? What am I talking about here? Practical ideas and concept because what? Money matters. Okay, money matters. And God really wants us to be wise and follow those instructions so that we can have enough money that we can do our entire life comfortably without burdening our children, our grandchildren, our nieces, nephews, cousins, aunties, and, and some of them down the road. You know what I'm saying? Practical. This is the practicality. As Christians, it's not just hype. It's not just, how do you say it, extremities. You have to have practicality on top of everything else. Does that make sense to you? Okay. You got, then the other thing, should I have a savings account? Yes. Our savings have to be motivated. Am I afraid? Don't be motivated by fear. Don't be motivated by pride or selfishness, but be motivated by the truth is our wealth does not come from our work. We work every day, but we, we need the Lord to give us a blessing, and God is the one who blesses us. And in a practical sense, we are blessed because we have a relationship. Oh, there's Jesus again. We have a relationship with Jesus, but he also tells us these things, truths, so that we can know how to manage the season of life that he's going to give us. Some of us will live to 90, 100, 110. However long the Lord is going to have you live, you have to have the resources for that season of your life. Does money matter? Yes. There's no reason to be wealthy in your life. You can't take that money with you. You have to be practical, manage it, balance it, and every single day make sure that you are managing, know where your stuff is going. And some people you can't lend no money to. You have to know from a practical perspective, if you are, a, the scripture says, neither a lender or a borrower be. But if you happen to be in a position to help that one who's getting up on his or her feet, then be sure that they have the character that they understand, no, 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 I'm not letting you have this money. I'm letting you borrow this money. And here's what I do, put a deadline on it. Put a deadline on it. You got 45 days. You got 90 days. Give me my money. And I make them sign a contract. That's just me. <laughs> my granddaddy, he, used to, he, he would give you $20. But if you didn't pay that $20 back... You can go back to get any more money. I always gave my money back because I always want to be able, if I needed it, I want to be able to call them up and get some money. <laughs> so I always paid them back. But it was a very practical thing. I got 52 cousins and some of them didn't pay them back. Guess what? They couldn't do what I did. <laughs> anyway, let me get out of that. Okay. What am I saying? Listen, save your money. Be practical about it because God desires to bless us. Not only does he desire to bless us financially, but uh, he wants to bless us with well-being. He wants us to bless us with being generous. He wants to ultimately give us everything that we need in order to get live this life well. And I know we've had some teaching on tithing. I know there's some discussion about that. Listen, I'm a tither. And I, every first Sunday, I don't care what I'm tithing because that's when I get paid. I'm, I'm tithing. And I tithe. I was tithing on my gross until my bills changed, and I tithe on my net, but no matter what, I tithe. And gross or net, I give it to the Lord. Okay, I give it to the Lord because I want the blessings that come with being a tither. Some people say, well, you don't have to tithe in the New Testament. I would suggest that they got that wrong. 
Now, the New Testament doesn't have a scripture like the Old Testament. And those of you who are in our class, we talked about the five offerings that were in the book of Leviticus and what G how Jesus has come and all of those things have now been solidified in the one offering, which is Christ on Calvary. Do I give? Yes. Why? Because Paul teaches in Corinthians that God loves a cheerful giver. He loves a cheerful giver. And we give out of really uh, just a joy of the Lord being my strength. I give cheerfully because I want to glorify God. I give cheerfully because I want to worship God by serving him. I give cheerfully because I know the Lord has blessed me. And I don't have a tight hand. I don't keep a closed fist. I always say closed fists don't get blessing. You have an open hand. I open my hands because when I open my hands to the Lord, I am worshiping God, and I open my hands, and I am a conduit that money can flow through and get to do what God intends for it to do in the earth today. So that's what we do. Does money matter? Yes, it does. And we are practical in that, in that blessing. I, I'm a tither, and here's the other thing that I want to encourage us, particularly in our cultural dynamic. Listen, don't be cheap with God. You do not expect the Lord to be cheap with you. When the Lord blesses you, you want to run down the aisle, do three flips in the front, and run back up the back because the Lord has blessed you. And you know why he did it? Because you were generous. Generosity is a part of who God is. It is the generosity of God that gave us Jesus Christ at Calvary. It is the generosity of God that opened up every door. It's the generosity of the Lord that says, I will pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. But the scripture says, but thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that gives you power to get wealth. Remember the Lord when you are earning your money. Remember the Lord when you're giving your tithe. Remember the Lord because the practicalities of God pouring in some 30, some 60, and some 100 fold is because his generosity has been poured out to me, and I pour out that generosity the same way he gave it to me. I give it right back to him in the name of Jesus because I want the kingdom of God to grow and to grow bigger and bigger that the gospel of Jesus Christ might be spread across this world in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. You got to be practical. There are practicalities. There's some other things you think about, inheritances. Make sure you do your will. Okay. Y'all got quiet on that one. Do a will. Do your will. Get your legal settlements and get all your documents organized. Taxes, tax refunds, everything that's there. All of this is scripture. I know y'all think it's funny because you know, there's no... Uh, scripture that says thou shalt pay your taxes. No, but you live in a society, Romans 13, you live in a society that we want to do better than they're doing right now. They're kind of raggedy right now. But nevertheless, the, <laughs> amen. Ooh, Jesus, help me. So, <laughs> as the Lord prospers you, amen. So, we want to do that. Here's the point. You want to be able that, you, I say this to you with all, all due respect, in our heart, Tune into God and be a cheerful giver. You say, Lord, I need anything you think you have need of. This is what I used to do, and I still do it, really. I sow a seed for that. You know, I say, Lord, let me sow this seed because I need you to open up a door in this area of my life, whatever that happened to be. You op you're sowing a seed. It's not as if you're paying God anything. You're not. But you are just bringing your heart and your desires and your wishes and your hopes before God. And just like every time when you come before a king, if you read this over in the, New, in the Old Testament, when you come before your king, you always come with an offering. Okay, you come with an offering. He says, I bow down and I worship you. I give you an offering, Father, and I give you the best that I have. I don't give you the leftovers. I'm not trying to tip God, okay? I'm giving you the best that I have, and I'm sowing a seed, Lord, and I put the seed out of humility out of my heart. Lord, I'm asking you in the name of Jesus. This is the area that I have a concern about. Maybe you have a loved one uh, that's uh, on, the, on the wrong side. 
a child that's wayward, as we used to say. You say, Lord, I need my son, I need my daughter. So I'm going to sow this seed so that you could, and, and lift up a word of prayer. And maybe you want to buy a house. This is what I did when I was first starting to buy this house that I'm in now. I've been here for over 20 years. I used to volunteer every week at Habitat for Humanities. I helped build those houses. I helped clean those houses. And I was already a lawyer. Okay? So it's, I'm, not talk, I'm, trying to, I'm not bragging. You humble yourself and you do what's necessary. And I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, how do I do it? He said, I need you to do this. I would go over there, talk to those people, talk to them about their situations, talk to them about their scenarios, talk to them about their lives, and sow a seed of volunteering in the area for the thing that I want. I want my own house. So I sowed a seed by volunteering. Okay? I used to feed the homeless. I, used, listen, I still do that. I volunteer a lot. <laughs> Amen. So we do that because those are all seeds that we sow in the kingdom of God because we want the Lord to open up the windows of heaven and pour us out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. So we don't do it out of just impractical. But the Lord has given us a manner, a way, if you will, how to get things done. You know, come before the Lord with thanksgiving. Come before his presence with an offering. Come with him with worship. Come with him with a heart that's humble and bowed down. Say, Lord, this is what the need of my family is. My children, my grandchildren, my son, my daughter, my spouse, my work, my employment, whatever it is, Lord. There's a situation on my job. I need your help. Let me just sow a seed. Father, I bring this to you in practicalities. And, I'm, and no vendettas either. I just talk to the Lord. And I, let the Lord work that out. Right? I'm not being vindictive. I'm not being, uh, as they say, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I'm not trying to do any of that. All I want to do is worship God. I'm worshiping the Lord and saying, Lord, here's what's going on. And listen, here's the thing about God. The scripture really teaches that he sees all things. The beauty of the Holy Spirit is that he's always, he is omnipresent, omnipotent, omniscient. He is always there. And what we do is we need to recognize his presence. This is me. Recognize the Lord. And Father, I just worship you. I lift this up to you and I worship you. I bless you and I give you glory. I worship you. I magnify you, Lord. I worship you. This is what's going on right here. I know you see it, but I worship you. The scripture says, Romans 8, 26, likewise also because of our infirmities, we don't know what to pray for as we ought, but the Holy Spirit himself will make intercession with groanings that cannot be other. And he that knows the heart, that searches the heart, knows what is the mind of the Spirit because he intercedes according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good for those who love God and who are called according to his purpose. And so I start the baseline, likewise, also. Because of my infirmity, I don't know what to pray for as I ought. But Holy Spirit, I lean into you, and I ask you to intercede. And because the Holy Spirit is God, and Jesus is God, and Yahweh is God, I have access to God because I have access to Jesus, and Jesus is my captain. Hallelujah. He's the one that gives me practical ideas. And he, I lift it up to the Lord. I lift it up, Lord, and the Lord will say, sow a seed, get my checkbook. Now we give on the phone, whatever people do these days, cash app, Zelle, <laughs> you know, I give it. I say, Lord, I'm sowing this seed. And a lot of times, this is what Christians forget. Remember that you can give a memorial offering to the Lord. Just be reminded of that. You can say, you know what, for this thing right here, Lord, I'm assigning a task to this seed that I'm sowing. This is my memorial offering. This I give for this. And I ask you, Jesus, to open up this door that this can happen, that I can do this in the name of the Lord. And you worship God. Father, I want to remind you that I have a memorial offering before the kingdom. And I worship you, Lord. And I thank you, Father. I thank you for every open door. And everything that's not you, shut the door. Everything that is you, 
open the door. And I receive the open door in the name of Jesus. I bless you, dear God. I give you praise. I give you glory. I magnify your name, O oh Lord, because I know you are worthy of all praise. And I praise you right now. Thank you for answered prayer. Thank you, Lord, that, that my seed will not fall to the ground and die, but my seed will be fruitful. Magnify the Lord. I bless you. Hallelujah. I give you glory. Hallelujah. I worship you. Hallelujah. I praise you. Hallelujah. And I bless you. And manifestation. I'm looking for the manifest glory of God. Hallelujah. That's what manifestation is all about. Don't, don't fool around with these, all this out here in the street. That ain't it. You better stay in the church. Manifestation. Don't be spooky. It ain't spooky. You giving God glory. Hallelujah. I said glory to God in the name of Jesus and let the Lord work for you. This is about Jesus. This is about Jesus. It's about him working through me that I might give glory to the Father. Amen? Amen. Come on, say amen. amen. All right. The last couple of things as we move towards a close, I see my time. I want to say this to us. There are a couple of little things about in the Old Testament, there's this thing called first fruits. Okay? So in that context, Israelites, we're in Exodus and, and in Leviticus, in that context, remember that first fruits was an offering required by God of the Israelites. And you'll see it in the Old Testament law many, many times. In Exodus 23, the best of the first fruits of your ground uh, you shall bring to the house of the Lord. In Leviticus 23 and 10, speak to the people of Israel and say unto them, when you come into the land that I give you and reap its harvest, you shall bring the sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. In Proverbs 3, 9 and 10, it says, honor the Lord with the wealth Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns shall be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. And it, the most comprehensive passage about first fruits is in Deuteronomy 6. And so what, 26, Deuteronomy 26. And what you want to do, essentially what, this is what it does. The purpose of first fruits is to acknowledge how God multiplied the thing that you asked for, to acknowledge how he released you and how he gave you an inheritance. And you want to, and you come and say, this is my sacrifice, the first fruits of my increase. And it's my way to say, thank you, Lord, for the increase that you have given me. Thank you, Lord, that you saw fit to see me. This is my first fruits offering. The offering is brought because I want to display before God that the sustenance that I have, the substance of who I am, everything and every blessing that he has given me comes because I'm very clear that it came from God. I'm clear about that. I'm not trying to say some suit say, nah, this is from the Lord. And so my, my relationship, remember, bring your heart to God. Bring your heart to God. Your relationship is such that when you worship God, see, God sees the heart. He sees your heart. He knows if you have enough. He knows if you need more. He sees what he's, there, there's this thing, the scarlet thread, what, that he's with, woven into you. There is that thing that you're hardwired to do. Lean into God. Lean into God and get from him the answer to that question. You're like, Lord, what is my purpose? What is my purpose? Have you talked to Jesus? Have you? When you talk to the Lord, he'll reveal himself to you. There is a revelation that comes from God. In Ephesians, the first chapter, when Paul is talking to the church at Ephesus, and he tells them about the prayer, he said, because the Lord will reveal that to you. How be it when he, he will reveal that to you. It's that revelation and what we call an aha moment in Ephesians 1. 
It is God's way of showing us. So you got to bring your heart to God. Everything we have, bring it to the Lord. Whatever it is, the specifics, the non-specifics, the two loaves of bread, the seven fish, I don't care what it is. Whatever you have, wheat, barley, grapes, you know, pomegranates, olive oil, whatever it is, dates, honey, whatever it is, your heart, your heart, your heart, your heart, bring it to the Lord. And here's the thing, why it matters. We have to grow in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. So, I, and I say this because I have seen down through the years, many people every Sunday, same person, running to the altar, running to the altar, spinning around, running to the altar, running to the altar. And I always wondered to myself, have they given that to the Lord? Because God will deliver you if you want it gone. Practicalities. If you want it gone, he'll deliver you. So it always gives me pause, particularly when I see him, the same person. I'm like, okay, something. They're not talking to God during the week, but on Sunday morning they come down, and you think that's the Holy Ghost, and that's not him. That's you and your flesh. Sanctified church. Come on, say Amen. So you got to lean into God. Give your heart. Listen to me. Give your heart to God so that you can be delivered. Because the whole point of this life is that we want to live for who? Jesus. And here's the thing. You have something that we all need. We need you to be better. We need you to be able to bring that gift to God so that the design that God has in you can manifest so that he can provide for us what your gifts and talents are so that we together can grow in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. We have to grow together. So first fruits, amen. Creation, Romans talks about it. <clears throat> John talks about it. The Holy Spirit, in John 14 and 26, he is our first fruit. Bishop talked about it on Sunday. He's a guardian. And I, and I love that because he leads us and guides us into all truth. He is a guardian. He watches over us. And you know if in any way, and I'll go back to being 20 <clears throat> for a few seconds. I wouldn't do it now, but going back to being 20, when you were sitting on that bar stool, Come on, don't act like you didn't know. You know. And, that, and you got that gut check. And you knew it was time for you to go. Come on, you know. That was the Holy Ghost. You need to leave. And you're like, ooh. All your friends hanging out. And you, you start to pack your stuff. You're like, girl, where you going? Girl, I got to go. I'll catch y'all later. Bye. And then you gracefully get into your car and you leave. And you hear on the radio the guns and flew off. Come on, y'all know. Huh? Don't act like y'all ain't never been there. You have. It's the grace of God that you're here. Because the Lord, the Holy Ghost, told you to leave. And thank God you listened. Right? Say amen. 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 All right? So our, this is our hope. This, this is the last couple things. And then we'll get ready to get some Q&A. Okay? <clears throat> The first thing that we're talking about, going back to money as a practical, uh, practicality, is Christ. Follow Christ. Act as a promise. The, one of the favorite things that I uh, think about in Corinthians, again, the promises of God are yea and amen to the glory of God. But there are promises to us as New Testament believers, and including matters related to money, because it's just a tool for a blessing. That's all it is. When God told Abraham in Genesis 12, I will bless you, he says the same thing. You take that forward to Hebrews 6, I will bless you. The blessing, it's not just having money for money. It's the money is a part of the process of what? Blessing. So I want to be able to be blessed in the city and blessed in the field and blessed going in and blessed coming out. So I give my offering to the Lord financially, I don't mind giving God something 
Because I know that's a conduit, an avenue, if you will, for him to pour out his spirit upon me that I might receive the blessing of the Lord. And I, I commend that to you. Be blessed because you want to follow Christ. In all the creation, every promise that God has given us, it is to be a part of what it does. Your first paycheck, make sure you tithe. If you sell something, tithe. Get a paycheck, tithe. Get some money, tithe. Go to the store, tithe. Auntie Nim give you a quarter, tithe. No, I'm just kidding. They don't give quarters anymore. It's got to be at least a dollar. Anyway, here's a, so here's my rhetorical question. And I say this because I claim the promises of God. A lot of times people don't claim the promises of God. My, my rhetorical question to you is, what promise are you claiming? What have you asked God for that you claim and you have Scripture to back you up? This is what the Word says. This is mine. Third John said, Beloved, thou mayest what? Prosper and do what? Be in health even as your soul prosper. There's a lot of promises just in those few little words. Okay? There's a covenant of health in there and a covenant of prosperity, even as your what? Your soul prospers. As my mind, my spirit, my body, through the trifold nature of man, spirit, soul, and body, all of that is in that, just in that third John 2. So what scripture, and I say third John 2 almost every day. I got it right there on my, on my bench. Because why? I want to prosper even as my what? My soul prospers. So I need the wisdom the practicalities, the guidance, everything I need in order for my soul to prosper and be in health. And be in health. Okay, I don't want to be broke down. Help me, Holy Ghost. I don't intend to be. So I do the right thing. I eat right. Thank the Lord. I'm doing, and I'm learning how to do some of this vegan stuff. Hallelujah. <laughs> I know that's funny. It's true. <laughs> but it's, it's a, a part of my season of life, okay? So in your season that you're in, evaluate what is best for you in your season of life. If you're in your 20s, it's a different thing. If you're in your 40s, your 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, whatever your season is, evaluate that. Why? Because how can I do life with the Holy Spirit in this body that God has given to me that I might give him glory? Does money matter? Yes, because I... Getting good, good health insurance. I get good this, get a good doctor, all of that. All of that is a part of this blessing that he gives me because of my relationship with Christ. I absolutely believe that people, I, I don't know how people live without Jesus. I absolutely believe that we need Jesus Christ every single day. I tell people all the time, what's going on with you? I say, baby, you need Jesus. We need the Lord in our church, in our homes, whatever we do with your children, your babies going to school, the teachers, the situation on the corner, whatever it is, you need the Lord. I offer you Christ. I commend Jesus to you. I think that the New Testament teaching is such that the church of Jesus Christ has to be a witness to everything that he does. He gives us the faith. And he entrusts us with being a witness for him in this season and in this day and time. So I commend Christ to you. I think my time is up. I commend Christ to you, and I want you to know that you can be wise about money. Be wise. Save your money. All the things that we mentioned, every little practicality that we've talked about, and I didn't even exhaust all of them. But do your research. Get your life in order so that you can live in a way that benefits you, your family, and your community so that all of us can do what? Glorify God. Amen? Amen. Come on, clap your hands in the name of the Lord. Let's turn this over to our facilitator.
What's happening now is there's a QR code that's going to be put up there. There are persons who are watching and streaming, and they are allowed to send questions in to Quentin so that he can give them to us so that we can answer them if we can. Check, check. If you all feel, if you don't feel comfortable maybe coming over here and standing to do your question, you can also do a lot. Or you can come stand this aisle and we'll go ahead and administer the question and Thank answers. You. So questions here or you can use it live. All right. Thank you. We're having a challenge with our mic to our IT team. Can you help us? You want to take mine? Yeah. Or no, I think we're good. Okay. <laughs> okay. I think we're still going in and out. There we go. Are we good? Check, check. We good? Okay, we're good to go. Do I have any questions in the house right now or was utilizing the QR code? Somebody's coming. They're switching mics for you. All right, we have some from our e-church audience. Let's see. So going back to the basics, the question that we have is from our YouTube audience, eChurch, and they are asking, what is a memorial offering? Can you give a true definition? What is a memorial offering? There is something that you have in your heart that you want. I'm going to give you a practical definition. Something that you have in your heart that has not happened that you're asking the Lord to make happen. And what you're doing is you are offering to God as a, as a memorial for that thing, Lord, may I, I dedicate this offering, in other words, to you, and I'm asking you for this. As, and it has to be scripture. Don't just be, don't be out, out the way about it. Everything, listen, if I give you anything, I'm telling you this, be saved, be sanctified, and be full of the Holy Ghost. Jesus is not Santa Claus. We're not doing that. Everything you have and that you ask for, honestly, out of a heart of worship and a heart of thanksgiving, you bring it to the Lord and say, Father, this is going on in my life, and I want to dedicate this offering to you about this thing. And I bow my knee to God in humble submission, and I ask you in the name of Jesus for an open door that this thing can be resolved or this thing can manifest. Listen, I believe in holiness. So don't, don't. All right. Amen. 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 Clap your hands. <laughs> All right. This is from my in-person audience. This question reads, what scriptures do you use to back up your promises and claims to God? What scriptures do you use to back up your promises and claims to God? Well, the first set of promise scriptures, if you go to Deuteronomy in the 28th chapter, the first part of that, not the second part, but the first part, that's really, really good, that you're blessed in the city, blessed in the field, blessed when you come and when you go. You've heard of that before? That's Deuteronomy. The other one in Corinthians I love is the promises of God are yea and amen to the glory of God. Remember, do some research on... There are so many promises in the Bible that we as believers don't claim. I'm talking about New Testament. And not just healing, not just, Lord, this, this. This is some baseline stuff that we can claim. And I just rely on Corinthians because it's just all the promises of God. A yea and amen to the what? Glory of God. And so I Lord, said, Lord, this is because we're talking about relationship here. From my perspective, my relationship with Lord is solid. So when I talk to Jesus, I talk to Jesus. Say, so listen, boo, 
<laughs> this is what's going on. And I bring it to the Lord with all respect. I almost myself say, Father, listen, I'm having a struggle here. I'm having a this, that, this, so and so and so. I need some answers. And one of the things that I'm always talking to the Holy Ghost, show me this, show me this. Because your promise is that you'll show me what? Things to come. Did you read that? It's in 1 Corinthians, in sec, um, excuse me, John 16, 13. Read it. Somebody turn to it. John 16, 13. That's a promise that the Holy Spirit will show you what? Things to come. So guess what? I need to know something from God. Well, how do I talk to him? Well, likewise, also because of our infirmities, we don't know what to pray for as we are, but the Holy Spirit himself will make an intercession for us, and he will do, and he will intercede for us according, wait, 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 to the will of God. So it's not just me. I'm coming to the Lord saying, Lord, not my will, thy will be done. I'm submitting myself to the Lord, and I'm asking God, Lord, this is the thing. Okay, let me, let me get the Holy Ghost to help me. Come, come along. Because the paracletos that he is, the definition of that is he who comes alongside to help. The Holy Spirit will help you. Amen, amen. So we have another question from our e-church audience. It reads, do you tithe successfully from the gross or the net? Which one is the proper tithe? The proper tithe is out of the heart. That's the proper tithe because sometimes if you're making a million and you travel off a million, that's $100,000, give God glory. After you pay your taxes, it's probably more about $850,000 and you still give $85,000, give God glory. The question is, where is your heart? The tithe is from the heart. It's not about a set amount. Nobody demands that. I, you, you know what God has blessed you with. In the New Testament, it says you give out of your heart according to how the Lord has prospered you. So if the Lord has prospered you in a big way, give a big tithe. If, the Lord, if, if you say, Lord, this is what's going on, because out of my heart, I, what am I doing? The tithe is to worship God and to tell him thank you. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right, we have another question from my in-person audience. It reads, for those who are in, in deep debt, where do you start in making the right financial moves? Well, I would evaluate the debt first. Stop spending. Stop spending because all you're doing is draining your pocket. So that you got to close the hole up in your pocket. Stop spending. Take the time, this is what I do, and write out your bills. Create a practical checklist of your bills so you can see where they are. Sometimes you pay the smallest ones off. Just pay them off and don't use that credit card anymore. Pay them off. Cut that interest rate down. And if those others that need to negotiate because you have now increased your income by having paid off the smaller bills, you can contact the liaison of that company and say, hey, listen, can we work out a deal? Let me pay you five checks of $500. Sometimes you can predate those checks. Other times you just send them in. But you, you, have to, you have to take the moment. This is the discipline of practical and the practical results. Take a moment. Evaluate your debt. How much debt are you really in? Do you even know? Are you just hiding from creditors? Nobody, you didn't block everybody. You can't get no texts. Can't nobody answer no phone. You didn't got rid of your landline. You're on, completely on cell phone. Now you're on a burner phone. Because you don't want nobody to reach you. Because you hide from what? Debt. Stop that. Cut that out. Have the wisdom and the self-control, the fruit of the Spirit. Go back to Galatians 5. There is a fruit in the Galatians 5 that's called temperance. In English, it means self-control. So and find out from yourself, am I habitual? Am I just spinning just because? It's frenetic. It's like an addiction. No. Be delivered from that in Jesus' name. Okay. So for those who may have received the message incorrectly, 
would the you what? For those who may have received the message incorrectly, would you please okay. provide clarification on, for example, the memorial offering? Okay, how that would more align with, as we talked with uh, Dr. Tudman, reciprocity, as opposed to, hey, Lord, I'll give you this offering if you give me this the very no, it's, specific We're not thing. negotiating. It's not a negotiation. Yes. It really isn't. And there's never really a time, and I say this with you with all, all due respect, there's never a time that you can negotiate with God. Not in that sense. The question is, what's in your heart? What's in your heart? And there is, God is a reciprocity God. Yes, it says, give and it shall be given unto you. That's what that scripture says. Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together, shall men give unto your bosom. So that's the reciprocity right there. Okay? But the, the practicality of that is still, where is your heart? Okay? Where is your heart in your relationship with God, in that particular thing that you bring to the Lord, that you know, Lord, let me just, I want to dedicate this seed for this thing. And I cry out to God in honesty, Lord, this is really something that I'm asking you for. And remember I said, holiness is real. It can't be just some junk stuff. I tell people, don't be living raggedy out here. Okay? Don't live raggedy. I'm, that's not a Bible word. Okay? That's me, because I see it on so many levels, okay? But what is your life looking like? Are you disciplining you? Listen, here's what here's I tell myself when I look in the mirror. I, I evaluate me, and I tell me the truth about me, so that when I talk to the Lord, the me that's me, then I can tell God, oh, Lord, it's me, because me didn't see what me were doing, and me going to tell you the truth because you know, I know that you know that I did what I did. Therefore, I'm not going to lie to you because you and me, we was in there together, right? So practicalities, right? All right. Amen, amen. Thank you. All right, we have another question from our e-church audience. It's two-part. The first part says, is there a consequence in not giving that 10% tithe? And is there, also, Is there a consequence what? Of not giving the 10% tithe. Okay. And well, then, you cut your blessings off. <laughs> That's just my. <laughs> in the New Testament church, in the Old Testament, they could die. Thank God we're not in the Old Testament. Jesus paid it all. Amen. Amen. And because Jesus paid it all, in the, New Testament, in the New Testament church, we use the tithe as a baseline. Because you don't want to do less than they did in the Old Testament. Jesus paid it all. Okay, so that's taken care of. But the scripture says that you give according to how the Lord has prospered you. Okay, so if you don't want no prosperity coming your way, then be stingy. Remember I said closed fists can't give. You have to have an open hand before God because it's an openness to the Lord. I'm worshiping God. Amen. And the other portion of the question is, do you have a list of scriptures or direction within the Bible for basic financial practices? Proverbs. That really, you're going to find almost everything you can think of in the book of Proverbs. I encourage you to read the proverb of that day for that day. It'll help you be guided for that day. For example, the day I think is the 25th. Read Proverbs 25. Tomorrow's the 26th. There are 31 Proverbs. Every day of the month, there's a proverb for every single day. Amen. Another question from our e-church audience asks, how do we make stewardship strides to teachings tonight within the family when you're trying to break the, general cur the generational curse? Well, I would challenge you, don't start trying to teach it unless you have successfully done it. Okay. So... What we want to do is to be a living epistle. The scripture talks about that. In other words, I am the practical example. In my personal finances, this is what I'm doing. And then as you become more and more successful at it, your family members will see what you're doing, and over time, they'll get on board with you. But you can't make it a mandate because it has to be done out of the heart. Does that make sense? It has to be out of the heart. All right, the next question says, you mentioned tithing, which I believe is godly and should be embraced by all believers. But can you please clarify your statement on whether we should tithe once again if we have multiple streams of income? Should it be from all streams or yes. just one? All. 
All right. Another question is coming from my e-church audience, and it asks, do you, do you give any information about what an S-Corp and an LLC is? I actually do give that, but I suggest that you hire competent counsel. I direct people to choose the lawyer of your choice, especially one who is dedicated to business. Every lawyer is not dedicated to business. So you want to find a business lawyer who can help you with those things. What would you say to a person who is struggling financially but also wanting to be obedient with their tithe and offering? Start small and grow and grow. All right, whenever you say first fruit, this is coming from our church audience as well. Whenever you say first fruit, are you saying that is within the money that you would use to tithe or is that separate? It's separate. Okay. Remember the tithe and the offering. The first fruit is an offering. Okay, it's a tithe and an offering. And you give your tithe, that's your baseline. Okay, and the offering, that's the up and above. And you do that because... Listen, God has been so generous to you because everything doesn't require a first fruits offering. All right? And, and a first fruits offering is a manifestation of a significantly generous moment in, in God that you have received from the Lord, or you're going to memorialize something that you desire, okay, above your tithe. All right? It's so another question from our YouTube audience, and it says, you spoke on the manifestation through tithing and calling, it, calling on the blessing of God. How do I explain this scripture to a teen or young adult caught up in the manifestation slash TikTok movement? Well, ask that person, do they know Jesus? That's the first thing. The revelation is the Lord. The revelation is Jesus Christ. You know, and they have a lot of movements out here, and I say... Uh, the practicalities of this because we are the church. So the key for what we do is a relationship with Jesus Christ. And I tell everybody, have you met the Lord? So lead that teenager to Christ and then get that teenager in a Bible teaching church. All right, our last question is from our e-church audience, and it says, what biblical principles can guide us in making wise financial decisions throughout our everyday practices? What, biblical principles? Mm -hmm. Everyday practice? I would say, I'll go back to Proverbs for a minute. The scripture says, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, is all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. So every single day, acknowledge the Lord, and he will direct your path. That's Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. And if you just look at all the Proverbs, the Proverbs for that particular day, I promise you that there's something in that moment for that day that will guide you through that day. Proverbs, one proverb a day. They're all ready. You don't have to worry about which date. Just look for the number. Proverbs 1 on, on the first, second, every day is a proverb for that day. Read that proverb. Read that proverb. Meditate on the word of God. Meditate on that proverb and ask the Lord, Father, thank you for this. Because proverb is there to give you wisdom. Okay? And wisdom is the principal thing. And therefore, get what? Wisdom. And in all you're getting, meditation, get an understanding. That's what that's for. And then, because the Lord will show you things to come. Right? Amen? Amen. There's a survey online. Please do your survey. We are, this is a model class. This is our template. We are doing a model class here in our church. We want to hear some feedback from you because we're asking uh, to be able to put this into a more practical level. So if you take a moment, there's a QR code. Please, sirs and please, ma'ams, please fill out like your survey. We encourage you to do that. You are invited to come to the house of the Lord. We welcome you in the name. If you have not received Jesus Christ, go to the website. You can have a prayer. Come see the Lord. Come see me. Come say hello. Amen. Come be a part of our family. We worship God. Come on, clap your hands, everybody.